Greg McPherson. Welcome to Unscripted Moments, a podcast about propaganda. Greg, how you doing, man? Excellent. Thank you so much. How's your day going over there? Yeah, it's going good. You know, it's the first sunny day here in Winnipeg in a while. It's been a real uh, winter. It's just gone and gone and gone and stretched and spring was garbage. So today, actually, it's nice outside. I'm really uh, feeling good. I think the whole city just like turns on a dime. People are all walking around with shorts on today and Mm -hmm. not really it's not really warm but it's it's enough that canadians kind of come out of the woodwork so yeah i feel pretty good i'm excited to talk with you i tell you what it's the same thing here in buffalo uh, a notoriously bad weather city so i feel your pain on the long on the long winters our our winter isn't as cold as bitterly cold as what you get but we get pummeled with months and months of very heavy snow so i feel your pain deeply and i'm glad to hear that it's turning a corner for you up there um yeah so, Greg, let's go ahead and have you introduce yourself a little bit to the audience, however you see fit. There may be some people out there listening who um, aren't familiar with your work or maybe need a little bit of a refresher. Sure. I am, I'm uh, a musician and uh, community organizer, I guess, in Winnipeg. And Winnipeg is about eight hours north of Minneapolis, so a couple hours north of Grand Forks, North Dakota, <clears throat> across the border. And, uh, yeah, I'm... Uh, I'm a musician. I started playing music in the early '90s in Winnipeg, and um, I put out a lot of records on on G7 Welcoming Committee Records, a couple of independents, uh, Small Man Records, a record label out of uh, Europe um, called Play Rec out of Copenhagen, and then a bunch on Disintegration Records, which is a label that I own. And yeah, and then I work. You know, now I work for the City of Winnipeg, actually, which is kind of weird, but. It's uh, it's a cool job and um, kind of continuing a, a lot of work I've done over the last 15 years, 20 years, I guess, really doing community organizing. And and I'm trying to get Winnipeg to modernize the way we look at uh, crime prevention. Mm. So, yeah, it's pretty, pretty interesting work. And uh, I've been doing it just for the last six months. So that's me Wonderful. in a nutshell. Yeah. What, what was the uh, transition into that work? What were you doing just before that? I'm just curious. I was the executive director of a nonprofit, um, a neighborhood renewal corporation on the west side of Winnipeg's downtown in the inner city. Winnipeg's a really uh, interesting city. It has a long history of, uh, of I guess, segregation is a good way to put it. Um, it's a it's a colonial city. Uh, this was the traditional homelands of a number of indigenous um, populations and and peoples and nations. And so the history and kind of story of Winnipeg is really how we relate to, to those, those people and um, as settlers, I guess. And uh, yeah. And so I've been, I've been uh, working in this area for a long time. What West Broadway is, is a neighborhood that had a high population of indigenous people. And, and uh, a lot of the past 20 years has gone into trying to figure out you know, more and more so how to how to uh, work together to make the, the community a better place for everyone to live. And um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. It's a great, it was a great, great work. I was there a long time. So I, I saw this job come up and I was asked by a colleague to, to look into it. And I did. And so far, so good, a little bit weird working for government. That's not really something that I've done a ton of, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying it out. Amazing. You know, I kind of feel like all of the stuff you just described, like considering you're a G7 Records alum at this point, it kind of fits in with like almost like the mission statement that that label was going for all those years ago. Like they were a label that worked with like uh, activist oriented artists and things like that. And it sounds like you're kind of, you know, taking that um, into a new path, you know, that's, it seems pretty much aligned with, uh, with what the label was going for back in the day. Yeah. I think that I fit on that label in a weird way. You know, I, I think that my, uh, my actual life and uh, who I am is probably the best, the best fit, like not, not necessarily my aesthetic or the work that I was doing as a musician, you know, mm-hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't making hardcore music, but, uh, you know, just Winnipeg's a fairly small community and, and I knew, I mean, obviously, I knew of propaganda in the '90s, but I I also knew a couple of the of the people from that from that band and from the community, and um, just as as neighbors, right? So uh, it made sense in an organic way to be, be working with G7 to put out my music, and uh, 
Yeah, but it's a weird fit for sure. It's a weird fit. But I think, yeah, just my life and who I am, what I do and what I've been doing for a long, long time to sort of fit in with with the overall kind of uh, philosophy and ethos of, of the label at that time. Was there an order for you? Were you into activism first or into music first? Like, was were those, did they develop at the same time along your life path? How did that all come together? Well, yeah, it was. I, you know, I was involved in student politics, student activism in the in the early 90s a little bit and um i got a degree in labor studies it's a long story but i i ended up getting pretty pretty focused on the idea that i had to take some responsibility with all the privilege that i have in my life to do something that leaves the world a better place for me having been here and and talking with some of the other artists on the label over the years i think that's a sensibility that we all sort of shared and um Certainly Derek Hogue, who's, you know, one of the driving forces behind the, the last real like 15 years of, of, or at least the last 10 years of that label's existence. Um, that was something we talked a lot about. And yeah, no, I, I got on to G7 and, and then, you know, it's funny because our first album that we put out with them, Good Times Coming Back Again, was released in 2002, but we finished recording it on September 10th, mm. 2001. And so the day before 9-11, you know, and then releasing that album at that specific time on that label, surrounded by, um, you know, hardcore artists and and uh, touring, you know, with the Weaker Thans and with uh, Propagandy and and playing with a lot of those bands, like it, it really politicized what I was doing. And, and I kind of drove a little bit of that activism, I think, to get a bit more serious um, and focused and better at it. And, you know, I think we probably all have, you know, uh, the can the Canadian equivalent to a, to a, uh, FBI file or whatever, <laughs> I'm sure, especially back then. Right. We were all, uh, looking, uh, cr very critically at, uh, at our border, at our, um, our security, our security infrastructure and, uh, and, and talking about it in, in, in a vocal, in a vocal way, very loud way. So, yeah, I, uh, I'm proud of those years. I think I learned a lot and, um i'm really yeah i'm proud of the music that, that i was part of and yeah anyway i'm i'm off on a tangent on you but uh it's been a while since i thought about this so i'm excited to talk with you about it and i, I appreciate you reaching out oh heck yeah well I'm, I'm just wondering about uh how the signing to g7 i don't know if there was actually like a formal signing or anything like that like how like um indie labels worked in the in the uh late 90s early 2000s but i'm wondering how you got hooked up with the label and decided to make a go of it with them particularly yeah that's a good story well you know i i, I had a couple of different labels local labels that i was looking at and I was friends with musicians who were taking it fairly seriously. And they all said, you know, you should put your, get a label to put your record out. I did one independent, I did a couple of independent releases. And then uh, I think I just stopped by the G7 offices. And At George, Albert Street? Yeah, yeah, 91, yeah. And I, I dropped in and George was there. And I was just like, hey, uh, you know, hi, George, I'm Greg. And, you know, <laughs> we met at some point previously. But uh, he's like, oh, yeah, man, yeah, it's, you know, yeah, I, I, I know you. And I uh, gave him a cassette or something, right? And I was like, yeah, I'm interested in, in putting out some music. I don't know if you guys are, are looking to put out any local artists. But anyway, that's kind of how it went. And, and I think George just forgot and, or said no or something. But then um, maybe a month or two later, I got a call from, from uh, Lorna, Lorna Vetters, who was one of the original people working with, with G7 mm -hmm. at that time. And, and Lorna, she's in San Francisco now, I think, but. Anyway, um, she's like, I don't know what George was thinking. Like, are you still interested? We're still, in we're totally interested. Like, let's put something out. And uh, yeah, it was great. That was, you know, I, uh, yeah, it was a, a great decision and, and uh, very lucky uh, that that all worked out the way it did. I love that, uh, that, that that all happened. Isn't Lorna the one who did the narration on the propaganda uh um, letter of resignation the john k samson song on that seven inch i think lorna recited the poem on that on that john k samson song oh uh, you'd know better than me that rings a bell though yeah that's that's like some cobwebs in my brain you're, you're yeah yeah to dig out yeah that's sure. that sounds back. right um 
Okay, so whenever you started releasing music with the label, I know that there's a history of you playing shows with Propaganda specifically, among many other bands, obviously. But I'm wondering if you have any stories or standout memories of being like a solo performer on like a bill full of like rowdy maniac bands. Like, yeah, I'm just curious about your your experiences with that. Like if it went well, if it went horribly, maybe somewhere in between as well. I'm just curious about stuff like that. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Yeah, it's some of my favorite moments happened when I got kind of uh, shoehorned onto bills that were, you know, thrash bands or really like hardcore bands. And then me and I'd be playing by myself. Right. And and you'd have people in the audience that were just so angry that I was, <laughs> you know, um, subjecting them to this, this solo artist music and and but it did force me really to kind of be, become a more dynamic performer. I think I had that anyway. But this this um, chapter in my in my kind of music career or whatever you call it is uh, it's definitely a time of, of like I really had to grow. I remember one time playing here locally. The first time I opened for Propaganda was here at a at a venue that's gone now called Le Rendezvous in the French part of Winnipeg. And yeah, I played. It was I don't know couple thousand people hmm. and everyone was going nuts this is probably 2002 maybe something mm-hmm. like that and uh yeah i played solo and it was great it was really great people went kind of wild and and i went to a place in my brain that you know was very, fairly dark and and angry and um it's the first time i had done this song uh, bank robber by the clash and i did a version of it that it's kind of different and and people really dug it and it was uh yeah it was fun but i did a tour with them down the west coast a few years later and uh i did a few solo tunes there but the audience is just so so you know wild and and really um committed and and uh and outrageous like propaganda's audience i think like no offense to you i'm sure you have your own podcast so i think you're probably front row kind of going going wild sort of a fan right i love them yeah and uh and a lot of people are are really really passionate and and have a kind of an attitude about propaganda that's almost like fever pitch right Mm -hmm. and and like there's so much there's so much ideology and and uh, life choices and and just uh, they're, they've really kind of crystallized a lot of people's thinking about where we are in the world at any specific moment in all their albums, right? And, and um, yeah, to be part of that on tour and be kind of uh, face-to-face with that audience that's like, you know, show me what you got, you know, weird mm-hmm. Canadian solo artist, right? It was great. It was really, I think things went really well in those tours for me and, and um there are some intense moments, like people throwing beers at me and right. Like lots of people just like, you know, get off the stage and, you know, which, yeah. is, which is super fun in a way like that, that kind of challenging um, almost violence in an audience, but, but also really just respect and reverence for the, for, for propaganda and for kind of like a movement. Right. So yeah, we got, we got treated pretty well by that, by that audience. And um Yeah. I had a lot of fun playing those shows. Nice. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your uh, G7 releases in particular. So we've sure. got a few here. Um, we'll go through them. We'll hear a little bit of music, and then we'll chat about it some stuff later on, too. So I want to hear about Balance on a Pin. Uh, I'm wondering if you could tell me a bit about this time and place for this uh, this G7 release. This is, I think, the last thing we released. And um, this is an album I put out by myself in 1999 Mm -hmm. and um it i sold tons of them like thousands of copies of this uh it was the first album i ever really toured and um yeah i i guess kind of the connection to to propaganda for this album is probably um jason tate's on it jason's from the weaker thans Mm -hmm. um yeah there's some really really uh spectacular musicianship on this album uh the bass player from uh good times coming back again barry marachnik uh kind of helped produce this and he's gone on to play with all sorts of people um i guess probably most famous is, is nico case oh wonderful coast. yeah and uh, he's an amazing drummer just an amazing musician and uh 
yeah, that's a that's an album that's I, you know, I think it still holds up. I'm pretty young when I did that, and mm-hmm. uh, I I listened to it. I'm like, ooh, pretty young, <laughs> you know. But is there uh, um it, so you you had this was pre G7, and then they just yeah. re re released it like near the end of your time with the label. Yeah, yeah, I think you know my understanding of the label, and I mean I won't speak for those guys, but I remember a time when they were they had put out a lot of music in a short period. Yeah. And there's only so many bands that kind of are making music at a level that, that I think would, would suit G7 and are saying things and are kind of part of any sort of um, uh, value system that, that they can relate to and that they feel comfortable with. Right. So mm-hmm. I think at that point there was just a, uh, maybe a lull in, in releases and uh, Derek was like, Hey, would you think about releasing balance on a pin on, on G7? And I was like, yeah, that, that would be great. And I'm glad it, it got out there. It's really, um, yeah, it's for whatever reason, people still like that album. So it just suits me just fine. Love it. Well, yeah. uh, let's hear a tune from it. We're going to hear genuinely frozen. And I'm wondering if you can just tell me a little bit about this song before we uh, lead in for the listeners here. Yeah, sure. This is a song. It's kind of, uh, I was listening to a lot of, uh, I worked at that time for the city, actually, way back. I was a cemetery worker and I listened cool. to, yeah, I, I, for six years, I, I buried the dead and I wow. listened to our public broadcaster here and they had a, a, a kind of a famous architect writer named Moshe Safdie uh, being interviewed and he put out a book, uh, City, I think it's City After the Automobile, and I read the book right away afterwards and really kind of captured my attention uh, um, about urban design and, you know, the, the turn that our society has taken towards just absolute kind of worship and, and dedication to the automobile. And this song is sort of just my reflection of what it's like to live in a city that we literally uh, paved over our, our railroad tracks here. Like our, we had tram cars, like a proper, you know, streetcar system back into the forties and fifties. And they, they just raised it and paved over it. And they're still there every so often. On, yeah. On the, the tracks. Uh, yeah. They'll come up through the, through the road, you know? And uh, yeah, it seems like we're going to, we're going to get back there at some point. But when I wrote this, we were pretty far away from like a public transit system we could feel proud of. And, and uh, yeah, it's uh, I, I like this song. All right. Let's hear genuinely frozen from balanced on a pin.
So, Greg, before we talk about the next album, you just mentioned that you were a cemetery worker. And uh, I was thinking a second ago about how I was watching one of your music videos today from your band Figure Walking. And there's a cemetery in the video. Is that like, is there a connection there? Yeah, that was that was Brookside Cemetery, which is one of the biggest cemeteries in Western Canada. And that's where I worked for the most part when I was a cemetery worker. So any chance I have to go back there for I usually go. It's beautiful. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. Well, let's uh, let's chat about the next G7 release that I've got on my list here. Good Times Coming Back Again. This one came up a little bit earlier. And I'm wondering if you can just tell me a little bit about the production, the personnel, anything behind this record that uh, that stands out to you as an important memory of making this one. Yeah, you know, we we drove down. So Steve Bates uh, is kind of at this point, he joined my band and um, Steve was like a few years older. He was in a band called Bulletproof Nothing here in, in Winnipeg. And he also ran a label called Sister Records. And if anyone is interested in like really cool, you know, Midwestern um, Minnesota uh, Manitoba music, um, from the, from the early to mid nineties. Uh, yeah. Check out sister records if you can find it on the internet. But, uh, yeah, Steve and I rented a car and we drove to Toronto with all of our musical equipment. And, uh, this is back at the time, you know, G7 had had some money, right? This is mm-hmm. the, the, the independent label movement was in full swing and propaganda was massive. And the weaker then was selling thousands of albums and, and we were selling hundreds and, and, you know, in some cases, thousands of albums. <laughs> and so uh, there was money to be, to be, uh, to be made, I guess. And certainly money was being spent. So we went down there to Toronto and recorded, uh, like I said, just before 9-11 happened, we, we did a lot of the recording at that time. And a um, guy named uh, John Sutton, who was the bass player in the Weaker Thans, did a bunch of the recording with us um, as the engineer. And uh, Jason Tate, again, from the Weaker Thans, was my drummer for, for a number of years. And he's on that album. Uh, Barry Maroshnik, who I mentioned earlier, is, uh, is also on, on that album playing bass and yeah, it's all two inch tape, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an album that was made the old fashioned way. And, you know, we did a lot of splicing and cutting and, and uh, something we did another couple months later. It's a funny story, the mix too. I, I was living by myself downtown in Winnipeg in this little apartment and I had uh, like a walk-in closet as my bedroom is a really small studio <laughs> apartment. And uh, I was supposed to fly to Toronto to, to mix the album and, and finish it all. And I got a knock on my door and my caretaker, uh, I open it up and he's got like a, like a guy with him who's got basically like an ice pick or something in his hand. And they're like, Hey, we got to come in and have a look around your, your apartment. I think there's a leak. And he comes in and just knocks a hole, like big hole, you know, foot wide in my kitchen wall. And then he goes into my bathroom and he literally knocks down half of the, the bathroom stall, like the shower. And he finds the leak and he's, and I'm, I'm like, well, I got to leave. I'm going to the airport, you know? And he says, okay, well, I'll keep you posted. We'll have this fixed by the time you're back, you know? So <laughs> I call him the night before I got back and he didn't answer. And then I got back and there was yellow tape over my door. And oh, I opened God. the door through it and I looked down and, and there was literally no floor. There was just like floor joists. And down into the next apartment, there was also just floor joists and all my stuff was stacked in, in the uh, walk-in closet. So that was, I, you know, the day after we finished tracking, 9-11 happened. The day after we finished mixing, I came back to my apartment being completely decimated. So it was a, it was a funny start to that album. But uh, yeah, I think that one holds up too. There's a lot of, lot of songs on there that we still play and, and uh, I'm proud of it. 
Well, let's hear a, a tune from it. We're going to hear numbers. And I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit about this one. What stands out to you about it? This one, the memory I have of this is, is Jason and me. I had this idea. I wanted it to sound kind of like that, th- that album. Uh, I forget the name of the song. Mars, the band Mars has this one song. Um, fa- very famous, but it has a sort of a descending tone. And so we, we, had a, we found a tone generator in this old studio and we we did this timing thing where I would I would cut it in and out, and Jason took the tone generator and just tuned it down. So you hear on the on the recording, it goes like do 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 do. So that's that's me and Jason laughing our asses off with the tone generator, <laughs> nice like a, a gate. Yeah, yeah, it sounds cool. I, I, I uh, recently we start, me and my my current drummer Rob started playing that again, and yeah, I like this song. It holds up. All right, well, let's hear numbers. Okay, so the next release on uh, the next release I have on my list here is Maintenance. And I, I want to know about this record because I love this one. I listened to it today a couple of times. It just really is grabbing my attention right now as far as a lot of your material goes. And I'm wondering if you can just tell me a little bit about this one and what stands out to you about this record. Well, you know, it's funny because so G7 spent a whack of money on Good Times Coming Back Again. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I think they they probably broke even at least. but. I, uh, I've sort of felt, you know, I'm pretty blue collar and, and, uh, 
I like to hold my own in terms of financing. Like I don't like the idea of, of uh, owing anybody any money or anybody kind of doing me any favors, which is a sort of stupid, but <laughs> it's a longer story. But I, uh, I remember making maintenance with the idea of just like, let's make it really easy. Um, I'll play solo. A lot of people after I put out the, the last two albums were kind of saying, hey, you should, you should do a solo album. And, uh, and I thought that would be a good idea too. So I recorded these all uh, on the cheap. Um, recorded one in London, Ontario, which is not far from you. Uh, mm-hmm. It's up, up near Guelph, I guess, where you were last week. Yeah. And uh, my buddy runs a, a, like a recording school there. And he recorded a couple songs um, with a buddy of his who was a student at the time who's gone on to record like Justin Bieber and all like massive. Wow. Yeah, massive artists. So he it was pretty fun. They really knew what they were doing. And we just had a great time. And then I think I recorded a couple other ones, maybe with with Chris, if I'm mm-hmm. not mistaken. I think I recorded a couple other ones at his home studio. And uh, yeah, we put it out. I did the artwork myself and um there's one one photo on the in the artwork you can see of me getting a speeding ticket in my girlfriend's car at like three o'clock in the morning in there. So yeah, that's tell, what I remember about that album. <laughs> tell me a little bit about the uh, the the photograph on the cover of the skyline. I'm curious about this. Oh, uh, you know that's a that's a John Schlettowitz photo, and John Schlettowitz you probably have maybe intersected somehow with him yeah. over, the, over the episodes, but. John was a, you know, a real chronicler of that scene at that time in Winnipeg. And, and he's still, you know, he's still taking photos, but um, he toured with us. He toured with propaganda a lot. And um, I love his music. I I love his, sorry, his his photography. I've got one of his photos right here. In fact, like just Mm -hmm. sitting beside my computer and uh, I don't know if you can see it because I got that stupid blur thing on my (laughs) filter or whatever. But uh, yeah, John is a really special artist and, and just a really cool guy, very involved in, in the local kind of activist community for a long time, too. And uh, yeah, that's where that, that came from. I just wanted to support him. And I thought that photo was, was super beautiful. And yeah, amazing. Well, I, uh, I'm thinking about doing a version of the episode cover art using that photo. So I'm glad that uh, John's credit will be given within the episode here. So if I've uh, totally mauled that photo for the episode cover art, you can blame me 100% because the original is absolutely stunning. Um, is. And I hope that comes through to, uh, to anybody who may see it. Well, um, we're going to hear a tune from this one. Uh, we're going to hear Good Times and... I, I love the lyric. I'm just a fucking reporter. And uh, I love how you sing uh, the line Vaseline the lens. It's very, it's got like this intense inflection and uh, articulation. So I've been loving this song today a couple of times to listen to it. And I'm wondering if you can just tell us a little bit about uh, good times. Yeah, sure. That came out, you know, I, I wrote that. I lived on the West coast for about a year. I was super poor. It was the only time in my life I, I couldn't get a job. So I, I quit the cemetery and moved out West, uh, following, following my heart and, and, uh, it didn't work out. And, uh, but I got a lot of songs out of it really. You know, I wrote that song and a number of other ones that are on good times. And then, um, yeah, good times coming back again. I, I felt really good about that song. I think at that point I had already known that I'd be putting my next al- album out on G7. And I, I was, I had it in my mind that, you know, having, having political content in my songs was a, was a positive and uh, that it, it would help kind of fit with the work that, that, uh, you know, Chris and Jordan, Derek were doing and Lorna. So um, that's where that came from. Awesome. Let's hear good times. Touch down on the runway. I seen that old face staring back, pressed up against the glass. I heard a brass band wailing. 
little man got caught out of his skin It's on a bus across the border He's got his legs spread, his head cracked His hands against the wall, he said I'm just a fucking reporter Good times coming back again, again Good times coming back again So, Greg, I got one more G7 release here. We've got, um, let's see, we've got Night Flares. And in my notes, I have in big, bold letters, engineered by Chris Hanna and recorded at least partially at his house. And I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit about this record, the process of making it, the recording process. Tell me the, tell me the who, what, when, where, why. This is a yeah, it was a convoluted process to be honest with you. I uh, uh, Steve Bates, who I was playing playing a lot with, and and actually he co-wrote a couple of tunes with me on this album, and he he took the photo on the cover of this album and did a bunch of the cover art, like the the actual layout and design. And uh, Steve's amazing. Steve's um, uh, he goes by the name Dim Coast. If anyone's interested in his work, it's spectacular. He's a visual artist, but he's also like a soundscape artist. And like I said, he had played in a number of kind of seminal Winnipeg punk bands. And in fact, I think might've been Propagandy's first show or one of their first shows was also Bulletproof Nothing's maybe first show. Nice. And I'm pretty sure that they opened for, for Fugazi. Nice. Yeah. It was a real, like one of those nights in Winnipeg that's sort of legendary. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, Steve was all over this album uh, Jason lived in Toronto at that time. And I, I was living kind of in and out of Toronto at that time too. And out of a suitcase. So we, we did a lot of our practicing in Montreal where Steve lived or in Toronto. And, um, and then I moved back to Winnipeg, uh, for whatever reason. And we recorded the album in primarily in Winnipeg. And so, uh, yeah, at Chris's house, which was really funny. And I remember, I remember Chris's house, like, he had this living room with, with kind of the, was our vocal booth. So a lot of the amps and everything were in the basement. And then 
I would re I would re sing stuff if I needed to upstairs in his mm -hmm. living room. And uh, I have like one thing I have as a kind of an asset is a huge set of lungs. Like I can hold a note and sing super loud. Like I'm not yeah. a very dynamic singer in terms of my, my, um, technique or anything but i can really belt it out <laughs> nice and i got yeah but I, I there's this one song on the album i forget which one it is it might be called sun beats down or something and i had this big long note i was going to hold in the end at the end of the song and i couldn't do it i i could not get the the song to stick uh the melody to stick so after a while we realized it was because he had absolutely like soundproofed his living room and there was no air at all getting into that living room. Huh. So I was basically had exhausted all the air by the second verse of the song. And then every time I tried to do the, uh, the third final verse, I, I ran out of oxygen. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was great. I remember a lot about, about recording. Chris was, a, was just like, no ego, super, super sweet guy, really nice. And even now, like, you know, he's, guy's world famous really a, um, a well-respected artist of, around the world and and yeah. i see him all the time you know we'll see him at the grocery store or just walk walking down the street just and he's so gracious and kind and just a sweet guy and they were really generous to me and i didn't until i ran my own record label i didn't realize just how lucky i had had it yeah and so i have a lot of respect for chris and this process of recording night flare certainly added a ton to that because he was um super patient super easygoing and uh and, and really good too like i think his his skill set is is uh is there on display he did a great job he doesn't play anything on the record right he was just the engineer on it yeah i think so i don't think maybe he did some backup vocals or something something strikes me as as a possibility but uh i don't i don't think so no okay cool um Awesome. Well, we're going to hear a song from this record. We're going to hear Cutting Room. And this song wound up on another record, though, too, right? Like, doesn't this appear on a couple of releases of yours? This might be on, uh, I, found, I might be on the European release that I did that it's just like a compilation of, of songs from all my albums. Sunbeat Down? Yeah, Sunbeats so, Down. Okay, Sunbeats Down. Okay, so it's it's just a it's a compilation that Sunbeats yeah, yeah. Down. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, because I had never seen Sunbeats Down until I was looking through your discogs a couple of days ago. Um, so I didn't know what that release was. So I'm glad to actually have that clarified because I was like, does this appear on like another release? Is it a different version? Is it the same thing? So it's the same one, right? It's like there's not like two versions of it. No, no, it's the same. Yeah, it's just a different mastering job, really. There's probably subtle differences, but nothing in the mix. And uh, it's funny, though, actually, a buddy of mine, um, that my friend Cam, who I started Disintegration Records with, uh, you know, 10 years ago now, he just surprised me and remixed all of Night Flares. I had given him... Oh, cool. Yeah, and it's a great remix. Like, there were things about that process in the mixing that I... I kind of got frustrated by it. It's a long story that, that, you know, every artist has one of those sure. stories. Right. And at the end of the day, I, I was a bit frustrated by some of the mix and, um, and not, not at the personnel, certainly like we work with a guy named Craig Boychuk, who's great, but uh, we really tampered with his mixing and kind of mm. forced him to do some things that I wish we hadn't. <laughs> and so, yeah, we will put this out again at some point. I think we'll re-release night flares in the next couple of years for sure. Very and this, cool. this mix is really great. So tell yeah. me, uh, tell me a little bit about cutting room before we hear it. Cutting room. You know, this is one of a couple of songs on the album that, that the bed tracks, the bass, I played the bass on this and the Jason played drums and we recorded it on two inch tape at the same studio. We, we recorded good times coming back again in Toronto. And we mm -hmm. just had those, we had the, the bed tracks for a couple of those songs and, and we, we used them transferred them uh at chris's house and and just sort of built songs on top of them and uh, that's a this is an interesting song because it's sort of a, a transition this album i started playing a lot with a guy named mike germain who's a who's a, like a metis artist and just a really really talented guitar player and, and bass player and and singer and songwriter and yeah i got playing with him and and uh and him and steve together playing guitar was just like it was unbelievable. It really cool parts and um, and I'm and playing bass too. I love playing bass and, and so yeah, you hear on this uh, on this 
you know, this track, you'll hear Mike on one side and Steve on the other and me down the middle and the bass and Jason Tate playing drums. And uh, yeah, I love this song. I don't play it as often as I used to because Steve and, and Mike are, are both doing other things. You know, it doesn't feel right when you when you have a song that's so much about the people you're playing with. Yeah. So, yeah, I love this tune. All right, let's hear it. Cutting Room. So, Greg, some personnel has come up in the conversation. I've heard the name Jason Tate a couple of times. Uh, I know that Derek Hogue came up once, but did Derek Hogue play drums on some of your stuff? I think he did, right? He did. Yeah. Yeah. Derek played with me for a long time, actually, and I uh, loved playing with him. Just super forceful, strong, uh, wiry guy who um, his drum sound is, is like, yeah, he, he's a very special, very hard hitting, precise drummer but tons of, tons of feel mm -hmm. and, and great ideas. And uh, Derek's just a great, great and very smart man. Um, he is the person who's probably most responsible for all of the internet presence of, 
of uh, G7. Mm-hmm. Like he runs his own um, website design company called uh, Amphibian. Mm-hmm. And like most of us, if if there are still websites for these bands on G7, we probably all worked with Derek at some point nice. to make them make them half decent. So yeah, Derek's amazing. Nice. Um, and then I also saw Christine Fellows appear in your credits a little bit on the songs. Um, and Christine's come up on this show numerous times because of uh, her record "Roses on the Vine" comes up every now and then. And I wonder if you have any you know thoughts on Christine's work with some of your music. Yeah, actually, I'm on. I sing a song on one of her albums years ago, like at the end of the '90s. And um, Christine and, and John Sampson are like that; they're partners. And um, yeah, she's a really she's from Windsor, so not far from Buffalo too. Mm-hmm. You know, ended up coming to Winnipeg like I did, and and falling in love with the city. And uh, super talented. And um, she's on. She's all over, balanced on a pin. Actually, she plays piano and backup vocals and. Uh, yeah, I've been playing a long time and with a lot of different backup bands. Right? So cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty lucky. I had like J- uh, John Sampson played bass for me for a few a few shows, which was great. Uh, Jord played um, for with us for a long time for a few years actually. Jord was our drummer. Cool. On a number of tours. Yeah, he's just so funny. Like just a great guy to tour with because <laughs> he'd been touring so much for so long and like nothing phased him, you know, yeah. he's just like hilarious could drive all day and night and just laughing and told us great stories. So yeah. Yeah. A lot of good people. So a, lo- a lot of people who listen to this show also listen to Chris Hanna's other podcast that he does by himself, but also with Derek Hogue, Escape Velocity. Um, and I believe that you are the singer of the Escape Velocity Radio and Catastrophic Break with Consensus Reality introductions. Can you confirm this and tell me yeah. a little bit about this? Yeah, I don't know. It was, uh, they just, yeah, they phoned me up, you know, him and Derek, and they're like, hey, can you, can you do uh, an intro? Like, I used to, <laughs> I spent a lot of time at so Winnipeg at that time, too. A lot of the story of G7 Welcoming Committee Records is the story of 91 Albert Street, the autonomous yeah. zone building. And uh, it was great. You know, even now it still has the bike shop in the basement. And um, I actually got married uh, in the, in the offices that G7 were in uh, wow. years later, it became kind of a, you could rent it. It's a hall, you know, it's yeah, a I, building. I went up there in October. Did you? Yeah. 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 yeah I, my, I came my to those, I, I, yeah. I came to those shows at the park theater and one of, and the people that were taking me around Winnipeg took me directly to that building. And I walked all the way up to the top floor. Yeah. Yeah, John Schledowitz lived in the back with uh, with Jillian Roy, and um, those guys had uh, had their their warehouse and their offices in there. And um, yeah, then shortly after, maybe a few years go by, and they moved to the floor downstairs into like a much kind of nicer uh, office. And I spent a lot of time there, um, booking my own tours and and uh, working with Derek and and Chris and just hanging out and, and, and like, I, at that time just always was singing and I yeah. used to sing these ridiculous, um, <laughs> I don't know what you'd call them, but I guess that's where they got the idea. So they called me jingles. up. Me, yeah. I'd make up jingles all the time and I still do it, but, um, yeah, it was really pretty funny. I went to Chris's basement, of course, his weird basement studio. And, uh, you know, it's fun to go there. Like you just see, I don't know, Todd's, Todd's underwear, you know, George's weird uh, ear earphones that he that he wears to keep yeah. his ear from from disintegrating any further. And yeah, it's great. And I sat around with them, and I just we just laughed our asses off for for twenty minutes, half an hour. And I sang that about fifteen times and made it stupider each time. So yeah, I'm, <laughs> it's pretty funny when I hear that. I've, I've listened to a couple episodes, and I always forget, and and it uh, cracks me up. Um, so Greg, you spent a lot of years on G7. G7 is a huge part of your career as a musician. And I'm wondering if you have any particular G7 releases from the label that you really love that you wanted to shout out at all. You know, it's, uh, it's funny for me because like, I didn't have a, I didn't have a real background in, in hardcore music. And, and I, I had seen propaganda play maybe once when mm-hmm. I, when I joined the label and, um, and so I, I didn't know their music that well. I had uh, I had their second album, and um, but yeah, I think that the I really gained an affinity for Clan Zoo. 
mm. like Clan Zoo and, and Hiratsuken too from, yeah. from from New York. Uh, but yeah, Clan Zoo when when they first got signed, I was like, ah, oh, okay, cool. You know, there's another another artist on the label that's that's not playing, you know, thrash or or like uh, hardcore music and in, in in a kind of traditional way, right? Yeah. And so uh, we were a good fit, and we played some shows together that were super magical and. And uh, yeah, I love Clan Zoo's Rua album. It's super cool. They're kind of this weird hybrid I- Irish Australian band, mm-hmm. and um, they put a couple albums out on on G Seven. But yeah, Rua's just stands up. It's a it's a great album. Wonderful. Um, all right, cool. So, Greg, over the course of uh, the many years of Propagandy, I'm wondering if you have a favorite Propagandy song or record, and why. Yeah, I thought about this a little bit. I, you, you sent me that question just to be aware of, and yeah. I'm glad you did because I had to go back and, and really kind of figure that out. And uh, I'm I'm super familiar with Potemkin City Limits and also with uh, Today's Empires. And I think the title song from from Today's Empires, Tomorrow's Ashes, is my favorite propaganda song by far, actually. And I think it's because like on tour, that was just like it we hit a new level when they start playing that song it's like it's just such a great it's such a classic rock kind of anthem you know yeah. in a way it's so catchy too it's one of the catchiest yeah. songs in their whole catalog in my opinion it is yeah yeah and i'm you know i'm a bit of a I'm like a singer songwriter so i like the i like the catchiness and and uh yeah I like those guys are just such expert players and and this song i think is it's one of their finest moments for sure and i remember pretty sure it was this song on the tour i did with them we were in maybe it was like st louis obispo or one of those uh west coast california ventura no one of those cities anyway yeah yeah did a few stops in northern northern and and western um california and i remember going on stage i think it was during this song and picking up todd it was like mid show towards the end of the show and and this was a tour where they had this like Shitty McShake was this thing oh, they yeah. were doing. You heard about that? Where Chris yeah. would dress as Ronald McDonald or whatever. Yeah, or no, he like, dresses the Shake too. Yeah, we had we had a like they had a couple different outfits, and and so the tour manager Sam got in on it, and Derek was always getting dressed up, and uh, and at one point um, it was just silly. We were having a great time, and it was towards the end of the tour, and I remember going out and picking Todd up on my shoulders, and and he was playing bass during that song and he weighs like he's 200 he's huge pounds. he's a big guy yeah yeah i can tell you some stories about that it was great but that was pretty <laughs> funny and um i remember at the time thinking look what am i doing this guy's gigantic and he's yeah. just thrashing while i'm carrying him around the stage you know yeah so yeah but that was that's a, a great memory of that specific song for sure nice um okay well Greg, I've, this has been, there have been so many fabulous stories uh, that you've shared here. And, you know, let's, we could bring it up to today. And uh, you mentioned earlier that you have a record label, Disintegration Records, and that you learned a lot about, you know, label stuff from your time on G7 and that you're doing it now. And I'm wondering if you can just tell the listeners a little bit about what you're doing with Disintegration right now. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, G7 started to wind down and, uh, I, I think at that time too, in, in my mind, I had, I had kind of hit a wall in terms of what I was doing musically. And I thought oh, I'll just do something different. And so I, I shifted over to this local label called small man that ended up, my record was the last record they put out mm-hmm. ever. And then, uh, after they kind of, uh, disintegrated for lack of a better word, um, I had another album that I had just finished and I thought, eh, I'll just put it out myself. Like, how hard could it be? And uh, I had been playing at that time with a number of local artists, like uh, a band called Cannon Bros, really young, really incredible musicians. Um, and I was in another band called Nova and another band called Slow Dancers. And we were all making albums at the same time. And so me and my buddy Cam, who was the engineer we were all using, thought like why don't we just make our own label and we'll put mm-hmm. these albums out and so we did and and i think we've yeah we've done at least 10 or 12 albums over the last 10 years and not a ton like it's not like a, a back-breaking uh breakneck sort of a speed that we're, <laughs> we're releasing albums uh but we still do it and 
it's pretty low key. Like none of us have, have spent a lot of time or energy on it. And uh, I don't know. I, I, I think that I might not release my next album on disintegration. I think I'm at that point now again, where I'm like, yeah, I tried this and it was fun and, and interesting, but um, labels have a lifespan too. And I think that they're a good snapshot of a point in time. And G7 is a great example, you know, of this, they really captured uh, a, a, mo- a movement and a moment. And I think disintegration to some extent did as well, particularly in its first five or six years. So yeah, nice. that's, my, that's my label. Did you, uh, did you do vinyl on disintegration? We did. Yeah. We did one album called fireball that my drummer and I did. And, um, we also put a vinyl album out for the cannon bros too. Um, I think that might've been the only two. Yeah. yeah. Cause I, I know that vinyl right now is insanely challenging for indie labels. And I was just wondering if you had run across any of that craziness lately. Yeah, it's interesting. And I could, you know, this is a great story actually. So one of the, one of the kiss of death for kisses of death for, um, indie indie labels is when you invest a ton of money you don't make much right so if you have a little bit yeah and you put it into an album for a band that just breaks up immediately yeah it's pretty hard on the on the label and i remember that happened with i won't tell you the artist but i remember g7 really sinking a bunch of money into one of the bands and and really getting burned like yeah they had put tons and tons of energy. And I remember all of it because I was hanging out at the office all the time. Like it was kind of my office too, really, you know, not, not really, but I've made it my office and sure. uh, they were gracious enough to let me hang out. So I remember that being a real, a real blow to the label. And, and that I think too, is one of the reasons why I wanted to put maintenance out and have it cost G7 almost nothing, you know? Yeah. And so that, and I, and I remember it at the time too, of just saying, whatever money maintenance makes is yours. Like just take, take it, let's put it to the label. And, but a lot of artists didn't really think of it that way. It's always a bit of an adversarial uh, thing. Even if it's your friends, sometimes you forget and, and your uh, egos get in the way. And yeah, I, I feel like disintegration that happened to some extent where we just didn't have any money. People weren't selling tons of albums and no one was willing to tour. A lot of the bands made one album and then broke up. And so doing vinyl, we did the one run of vinyl for the Cannon Bros and then they, they pretty much broke up and weren't mm. playing anymore. And so we had, you know, 300 vinyl pressings, like co- copies sitting in, in my office at work for five years or something. Ugh, like that. Bummer. <laughs> That's life. You know, it's a great yeah. album. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah you know, I, I was talking recently to a, a Winnipeg songwriter that Jason Tate played with plays with named Jacob Brodowski. And he was talking to me a little bit about the, what he, what he sees is like the specialness of the Winnipeg scene. Like there's a, a, a very, it's a very tight knit sort of history. Uh, a lot of very literary and uh, intelligent songwriters have come out of Winnipeg. And I'm wondering if you can just like reflect a little bit about on uh, what makes the Winnipeg local scene kind of neat and a little special to you who has been a part of it for so long. Yeah, you know, I think a lot about that. And um, I, I, when we started talking earlier, I mentioned that, you know, the history of this city is fairly, fairly unique in, in a way. We have the thing that I think is our greatest asset as a, as a municipality is the fact that we have the highest urban indigenous population of any city in the world. We have mm. over, I think it's about 114,000 indigenous people or people who identify as indigenous live in Winnipeg and, and, um, for a long time, that wasn't that wasn't looked at as an asset. That wasn't celebrated. And I think that growing up here, whether we thought about it or not, we were really, um, uh, you know, in, I, I guess racism and and um, the idea of otherness and and just colonization uh, were were deeply ingrained in the way that we've lived our lives here. And I think for artists, whether you're aware of that front of mind uh, or not you really this is a city that's fraught with a lot of tension and cultural violence and and cultural difference and also some incredible uh, culture that's really beautiful and 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 different and unique so I think that the bands and and artists that come from here uh, some of us you know uh, we reflect that in a good way and um, that's my theory it's also this is this is what I always say is that like you know, for thousands of years, it's the 
the junction point of two great rivers like the red river comes up from the states and it's a massive uh water uh waterway and um similarly the assiniboine it drains half of this part of canada drains into into the red at the forks here in winnipeg so there's these two massive slow moving rivers that collide here and then there's these two we basically have two seasons i was telling you you know a couple of weeks ago there was snow yeah. on the ground right now it's yeah. like you know whatever 70 degrees fahrenheit down here and uh so we have like winter 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 from october to may yeah and then super hot summer until until september again yeah and so there's these the collision of these two uh seasons right and then there's the collision that happened here between the indigenous people and the settlers. And then there was the collision between the English and the French and then wave after wave of, of European immigrants came and then later uh, immigrants from North Africa and uh, Southeast Asia. And like, it's a really interesting city in that way. And, and there was a lot of segregation and, and uh, choices that were made that were definitely uh, racist and I think that, you know, growing up here, it's a, it's a city in the middle of nowhere, like literally an outpost. You it's know? really isolated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's isolated, uh, inherently isolated. It's at a molecular level, right? Yeah. It has this, this molecular uh, conflict. And uh, I think that kind of breeds a very interesting perspective for, for us. And, and maybe that's what's resonated so well. And a lot of us are, are hyper conscious of some of that, the political reality too. And I, I think that that has bred this sensibility that people like Chris Hanna and, and um, I guess, and me and, and John and others um, uh, kind of reflect in our, in our work. Awesome. Well, Greg, I've really loved spending this hour with you, uh, reflecting about the history of G7 and your place on the label and your releases on the label and hearing some tunes and, you know, just traveling down memory lane. And I'm wondering if you can just say where listeners can find your work if you'd like to direct them to any specific places. Yeah, you can, you know, I'm on, I'm on the internet. You can find me, um, disintegration.ca. It's probably, I think that link still works. <laughs> I paid for it recently. So I know it's going to be there. If you look, I'm going to, I'm actually going to look disintegration.ca. You have a, like a band camp. You yep, can go there, there it is. and get my music directly from us through Bandcamp, which is cool. It's also on other, you know, you can download it from other streaming sites, obviously too, but, um, yeah, I'm surprised you didn't ask me more stories about the boys there from Propaganda because I could tell you lots of great stories. I, I should mean, tell you one good one that I wanted to. Yeah, tell you. lay lay it on me. We got we got time. we can end here nicely with it. Yeah. Well, you know, I know you're gonna probably get me to the point where I tell you why I thought they're they're a great band and yeah, it's not because they can do a lot of chin ups. That's for sure. So one day <laughs> we were in a, I think it was like Olympia, Washington, or somewhere like that on the West Coast tour that we did and. And I don't know, we were all just backstage hanging out and there was a, like a pipe on the wall and I was hanging off the pipe doing, just goofing around. And, uh, Chris is pretty, pretty competitive guy, right? He's yeah. in the military, military family. And so, so was I, like we both had air force dads and, um, anyway, uh, and you and, you and Hannah both have distinctive biceps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We were in decent <laughs> shape, you know, at that time. So I said, like, uh, I forget how we were, someone challenged us to a, uh, a chin-up contest. Yeah. And Todd got right in on it too, right away. Todd's like, oh, yeah, let me in on that too, right? So the three <laughs> of us did chin up, a chin-up contest. And I, you know, I'm pretty proud of the fact that I won that <laughs> nice. really handily. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, no, they're great guys, man. I tell you, Todd is just like a, he's such a wonderful uh, person, great artist and, and just a thoughtful, kind and good person. And, and Chris too, is just like I told you earlier, has been a real gift uh, to know and, and uh, really gracious and good guy. So, and Jordan, like one of the best people I know in the world. So yeah, great, awesome. uh, great band, great people. And uh, yeah some cool fans i'm really glad to meet you greg thanks very much for inviting me on and, and and talking like this man it's been fun 